Um, as they're doing that, so for, for the next uh, panel, they will be asking uh, some questions um, and I will post their question on the chat in the QA as well. So please do respond. Tunawaomba sana tafadhalini kama mtaweza kujibu hilo swali kuhusu lugha ambalo linaulizwa na um, panel ya kwanza, panel ya kwanza. <laughs> okay. Uh, may, uh, sorry to interrupt you, Ida. I've just noticing that Nazra and uh, Teresa were yeah. supposed to be panelists. They are in the attendees. Uh, therefore, uh, just an announcement for Nasra, Abibo, and Teresa Poeta. Um, you need to uh, come out of this link and you need to go into the link that was sent to you as a panelist. Otherwise, you won't be able to share screen or you will be able to speak, but if you want to share screen, then you won't be able to. Um, so I think you go, yeah, I think they are, Nasra is I've now. I've just uh, forwarded it on to Teresa. No, you can't, uh, it is, it's a personalized, she can't join from your storm. Oh. Sorry, it's so very complicated with Zoom. Uh, uh, Teresa should have received her own uh, personal uh, link. Aki, perhaps you want to try to resend it, that might help. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that now. To Teresa Poeta, uh, I think she's gone from here. Yeah, Teresa and Nazra. Um, oh, she's okay. here as Hannah. <laughs> ah, okay, great. Nazra Vivo made it excellent. Okay. And then Teresa, you appearing as Anna Gibson. <laughs> I know your face, so <laughs> I can tell. Poleni, sorry, I don't think yeah. I have the panelist link, so Hannah kindly forwarded hers. Yeah, you, you can rename yourself, um, Teresa. Oh, yeah, we just just stay where you are. We just rename you. That's fine. And I'm I'm, I'm actually quite happy you're here, uh, Teresa, because I was looking for your link, and I can't see it. So it's a good thing you're here, because then you can post it yourself. Okay. I've just posted it in the chat. Yes. Right, yeah. Mikaribuni Tena, everybody, you're welcome. This is our third panel. Kovu hii ni paneli ya tatu. Na hapa tutakwa tunangalia zaidi isimu na lura. So we're allowed to look at linguistics and language. Um, and uh, so our first panel um, will, will be Professor Lutz Martin, Dr. Hannah Gibson, Dr. Frida Erastus, uh, Dr. Julia Staji and Dr. Teresa Poeta, lots of doctors, and also Tom Jepke, who will be looking at researching grammatical variation in Swahili. Karibuni sana. Fantastic. Um, thank you very much, <clears throat> Asanteni, um, for the introduction and the welcome. So yeah, we're just going to dive right in. Um, and our talk is, uh, as was introduced, researching grammatical variation um, in Swahili. So we're going to be talking about a very new uh, project. So we don't have many findings to share yet, but part of the link that was shared in the chat will you'll hopefully be helping us with our research as well. Um, so the project is entitled Grammatical Variation in Swahili, Contact, Change and Identity. Um, and it's a four year um, project funded by the Lieberhulme Trust, which is a um, uh, funder based in the UK. Um, really excitingly, it's a collaboration uh, between researchers at the University of Essex, Kenyatta University, SOAS, and the University of Dar es Salaam. And we think it's great that it's a really um, broad collaborative project, and that was always really important for us for this topic. Um, so this is the team. Some of us are here. Um, so myself, uh, Frida, who popped in, but unfortunately, because of the, the timing and other commitments, couldn't stay. Um, uh, Tom, who's here as well, uh, Lutz Martin, um, Teresa, um, and Julius Taji, who again is, is currently teaching at the University of Dar es Salaam, so can't, can't join us. Um, so we are interested in lots of things, but we've kind of narrowed it down to three key uh, questions. 
So we're interested in the present day <clears throat> morphosyntactic variation that's found in Swahili. So we know that there's work on kind of uh, variation in the past. We know that there's work on primarily lexical variation or phonological variation, but we're interested here in what we're calling morphosyntax, but it's essentially structures and, and grammar and trying to capture a present day up-to-date account of that. And then we're also interested in two other questions. So we're interested in the role of language contact and what role this plays in the variation that we find. So in different areas, how Swahili uh, differs, how much that's due to language contact. And finally, what the relationship between this structural variation that's found in Swahili and the role that this language pay, plays in the kind of construction of identity um, and speakers negotiating multiple perhaps um, identities. So there's sort of three interlocking questions there. Um, so why Swahili? Hopefully at Baraza. I mean, of course, all of you are, are interested in Swahili, so maybe we don't need to kind of justify this, but we do think it's important to kind of think about why and what Swahili could add um, to our understanding of lots of questions. So as we know, spoken by more than 100 million people across vast parts of East Africa, major language um, and has been a regional franca um, for a, for a long period of time um, and kind of growing um, in different spheres in present day. Um, first language um, of sort of Waswahili, so people uh, traditionally in the sort of uh, Uswahili, Swahili coast, um, but so this, this role of language of wider communication as well as um, in the role of uh, Swahili as a, as a language of the Waswahili. Um, Variety. So that's where we start being interested really in varieties or, or dialects. Um, and people have described dialects, and that's where one of the things that we're asking for. Um, but people have described different varieties. So you might have heard Kimbita, Kinguja, Kiamu, and so on and so on, spoken by different communities. So we know that there is variation. We know that there are different um, varieties. And again, in lots of parts of East Africa, Swahili is spoken in areas of high contact, so amongst multilingual communities, meaning that it has influences um, from other languages um, as well. And of course, we couldn't um, not mention here that there's also been um, in growing interest in so-called micro variations, so subtle differences that you find um, between closely related languages or varieties. Um, and there was this really uh, nice uh, special issue of um, Swahili Forum um, from, um, uh, Nico and Daisuke who are here in the panel as well um, on variation in Swahili. So people have done work and there's this growing um, interest in this but what we're saying here is that actually we haven't got this kind of comprehensive larger picture of present-day variation found in Swahili so we're trying to bring together some of that work as well as make our own um, contribution thinking also about kind of cultural and social identities um, as well. So I think at this point I'm going to hand over to Lutz it's going to talk us through the next part of the project. Uh, th thank you, Hannah. Trying to, trying to. I hope, I hope I'm, I'm on, 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 on site and on sound. Um, very good. Thank you. Um, so, um, in order to address our research questions, um, we have three work strands. There seems to be something magical about three. Um, so, the first work strand is the systematic examination of dialectal variation in Swahili, with a focus on morphosyntax. So that that's really maybe it takes us apart a little bit from traditional scholarship. And then the second one is examination of community linguistic repertoires to identify possible instances of contact and use change. So we are interested in what, what the interaction of different languages and different language uses, um, how that results in the variation. Um, and then finally, the examination of how Swahili usage and variation are used to establish and negotiate different speakers' identities. So that's taking us very much into the social linguistic um, realm. So it's, we're straddling, if you like, more, more traditional descriptive um, of syntactic studies and then looking through that at the, uh, the social linguistic context. Um, we have um, six target areas, if you like, at least for the moment. Um, so we have an examination of Australia spoken six target areas incorporating coastal and mainland locations, urban and rural locations, and predominantly monolingual areas, um, as well as those in which Swahili has been in sustained contact with Bantu and non-Bantu languages. So we have a little map there which shows these locations. So we have two coastal uh, situation, uh, coastal um, locations, Lamu and Zanzibar, so northern and southern um, coastal situations and also therefore varieties. Although of course there's also lots of dynamic change going on at the moment. Um, then two Tanzanian locations, Moshi in the north um, and Iringa in the south. In Iringa, you would expect the contact situation mainly with other Bantu languages um, whereas the further north we go, other languages play a role as well. 
Um, and then the Kenyan, uh, the two other Kenyan locations are Kisumu, where we would expect uh, quite a bit of influence from Nilotic languages and the other Bantu languages. Um, and then Nairobi, which in some sense stands on its own as a sort of very urban, very diverse, very dynamic place where people talk about metrolingualism, hyper, hyper diversity. Um, so that plays a role there as well. Um, so tied to the to the three work strands, um, we then have the, um, different work packages. So in work strand one, we're going to look at initial perceptual dialectology, dialectology service. So Tom has worked on that a little bit already and it's continuing that. Um, we want to identify key features of dialect. And then one of the key empirical basis of the project is the development of a Swahili dialect syntax survey. Hopefully we're working with 30 to 35 different morphosyntactic features, which you want to trace then through these different locations and ideally actually even wider there's precedence in lots of um, lots of languages, mainly European languages, I think at the moment have very detailed uh, dialect syntax surveys and, and they would have brought very interesting results. Um, so this is something we want to harness for our, um, our work strand one. Um, and then this we get to elicitation of naturally occurring speech. Um, in work strand two, we have comparative analysis of features with those of the, of the wider language ecologies and contact languages that takes us into a more analytical um, area. Uh, we look at broader social linguistic dynamics and levels of multilingualism. And that then leads very naturally into work strand three, where we look specifically at language use, attitude and identity. So we use questionnaires for that, uh, but we also have interviews with speakers to better understand linguistic repertoires, domains of use and attitudes towards language, language and identity. So in a part, it's the old question about what people do when they speak, what they, what they, what they think they do and what they think they ought to be doing. So we still have these layers of of, you know, if you like, focus, if you like. I think that was, is, oh, I'm here, hello. I think, I think we're done with the methodology, but not quite with the talk. Um, no, no, sorry. I, I in order to sorry. Uh, unmute myself, I had to quit the sharing. Ah, of course, yes. Because now, now I'm handing over to Teresa. <laughs> Apologies for that, but I think I'm sharing again now. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Ah, baby, baby, baby. Great. Apologies for that, and thank you, Hannah and Lutz. Um, so we'll now continue to show you some examples of what we mean by morphosyntactic variation, so that it's not so abstract, um, and some of the variation that has already been attested that we are hoping to expand on. So one example, which uh, many of you might have come across before is in expressing the habitual. So perhaps if like me, you studied Swahili at school or university, you learned the hoof or huenda, hufanya for habitual. But here we have examples of the suffix ag or aga that expresses some sort of habitual meaning. And um, so in example one, if from uh, Ruge Malia 2010, you can see uh, una kula gawapi um, to ask, where do you usually eat? So rather than una kula, una kulaga. And uh, to sort of cement the, the use of this feature, we also have uh, the lyrics of uh, bongo flavor singer Sumali in Hakunaga. So even in the title, uh, Hakunaga has the ag for sort of habitual or ongoing. Um, so this is an example of a variation that has been mentioned by quite a few people is sometimes used. And we are interested in uh, who, when, how uses it, which varieties, uh, whether it has to do with the language contact, whether speakers who use this feature maybe speak other Bantu languages which have this feature, or does it come into Swahili any other way? Um, so this is just to give you one of the examples. Another one, again, which I think some people here will be familiar with, is the diminutives. So when you want to express that something is small. So um, I think in standard Swahili, sort of the use of the key class is often mentioned as a way to make something small like kijiko or kijiji. Um, but quite often uh, we can come across examples of this ka uh, noun class. So in example three, kila mtu anahitaji kashamba kake. So everyone needs his own small field. So you can see the ka here being used also in agreement with this class 12, which uh, we say now class 12, because this is something um, present in some other Bantu languages, also in Proto-Bantu historically. 
um, but it now seems to be used at least in some Swahili uh, varieties. And the second example is from Sheng. So again, here you can see Ka Mano, again, the Ka on little man and the agreement of this noun class on the demonstrative and also on the uh, verb. I'm just gonna check how we're doing for time. Um, so these are just two sort of, of, of the, uh, of quite a few examples of variation that has been tested already. Um, and we have a third one that has to do with expressing locations, um, but also to just give you a taste a little bit on some of the methodological challenges and just things involved in looking at variation. Um, we would like to ask you, um, here I just have to figure out my technical skills. Um, if you can help us by now taking part in a replication of a bit of a study that I'll come back to. And uh, in a second, I think maybe Tom uh, has put, I will put the link also in the chat. Yeah, it should be in there now already. Great, great. Um, we'll, put, we'll ask you to judge a couple of three Swahili sentences and to think whether in the Swahili that you speak or you learn or study, whether you think that sentence is a very good example, something that you can imagine saying, or not a good example, so something that sounds wrong, you don't think anybody would say that in Swahili, or somewhere in between, maybe you wouldn't quite say it that way, but you think in a certain situation it could be said. Um, so either you can use the link in the chat, or you can go to slido.com and insert this code, or you can also scan this QR code, very modern, um, and hopefully you should be able to now give us your opinion on the first sentence, which is peleka majembe kwashamba. So perhaps not a sentence that you would use on day-to-day -day conversation. So bring the host to the field. Um, and you can now tell us whether you think this is a good example, not a good example, or you have mixed feelings about it. Um, so uh, there is no such like right or wrong answer. This is exactly about variation. So yeah, just whatever you feel about the sentence. Um, you can put it in. I can see some answers coming in. Maybe I give you another couple of seconds if some more people want to engage. Um, great. So maybe we can start having a look at a result. So Teresa, uh, just to say, we still see your PowerPoint slides. We don't see the, the slider. Oh, no. So okay. I think you just need to stop share and then share a different screen or window. It, there's a limited, it just says share screen, but I'll try again. Now? Great, yes, thank you. Yes, great, thank you for letting me know, Hannah. Okay, so this is what has come in so far. You can continue uh, sort of giving your opinion on that. Um, yeah, okay, so here at the Barraza audience, it seems that uh, um, sort of a split actually, so uh, majority thinks it's not a good example, but actually quite also a significant number is somewhere in between, uh, and some people are quite happy with the sentence. So I'll come back to these examples, but I'll take you through uh, other two sentences. So we'll now switch to the second sentence. So waumini wameenda kanisa. So the followers have gone to church. Um, so again, um, still using the same link or any of these, you can give us your opinion on how this how the sentence feels to you. Um, I'll give you a little bit more time. It's great. Thank you so much for <laughs> engaging with this, indulging us with our little linguistic study. Okay, and we can have a look at what it's looking like. So again, interesting that none of these seem to be straightforward, at least among the Baraza audience. So yeah, you can see uh, most people, again, think it's not a good example, but similarly, like previous one, quite significant number somewhere in between. And there are people who are quite happy with that. Okay, we can see mixed feelings going up. <laughs> um, great, perfect. Okay, and then just a third sentence. And that's walienda kwa juma. So they went to Juma's place. So again, you can let us know what you think. I'll give you just another couple of seconds. 
and uh, then we'll have a look at the study and these sentences again. Okay, great. So let's see. Okay, so here we can see it's a little bit more straightforward. So most people are, are um, happy with this being a good example. Still some uncertainty um, and a smaller number um, not happy with it. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing this now and just go quickly back to the slides. Okay, so. Uh, so the reason why we asked you about these three specific sentences, they might have seemed a bit unusual, but they came from the study that Hannah and Lutz, with our, also with our colleague Julius Taji and with Christina Riedel, conducted um, in, with students in Dar es Salaam. And this was looking at how uh, we can express location in Swahili. So either using the preposition kwa, such as kwa juma, um, or using the locative ni, shuleni, nyumbani, kanisani, etc. Or sometimes just using a noun on its own. For example, if you said peleka, majembe, shamba uh, on its own. Um, and there's quite a lot that came out of it, and we don't quite have the, the time now to go into details. But what is interesting is that there's definitely some variation going on there. So while in coastal Swahilis, and I think also what I've learned as standard Swahili, the kwa preposition, for example, was used or is used just for people, so for animate nouns like kwa juma, um, while wouldn't be used for uh, non-animate such as shamba or nyumba, kanisa, shule, it does seem that this is occurring in some varieties of Swahili. So you could say, for example, ninaenda kwa soko, or you can see even here, so this is the result of the of the study in Dar es Salaam, uh, with Peleka Majembe Kwa Shamba, more participants said it could be said than uh, the participants for whom this was not uh, a good example. Um, and there were more nuances to do with animacy. So also the fact that Kwa Soko is more sort of used than Kwa Shamba. Um, but perhaps we can come back to this in the questions if someone is interested. Uh, but so we know that there is some variation that the qua is being used also for non-animate nouns. And again, the interest is in um, how is it being used, by whom, what sort of variety, um, is language contact in any way relevant or what is happening there. Um, and similarly, also with the use of the locative ni, um, what came out is that there is variation in which which nouns you can use without it, such as puenda shule, or which ones without it are not really thought of as good examples in the study, like Kanisa, um, while some others were more straightforward, such as walikwenda kwa juma, this was accepted uh, anonymously as a good example. Um, so there's a lot to say in the variation that came out in this, but I think in the interest of time, I'm now just gonna summarize. Um, so as, we, as has been said, the project is in the very initial stages, but it aims to investigate dialectal variation in Swahili. It's linked to language contact and multilingualism and its role in constructing speakers' identity. Rather than lexical or phonological features, we are focusing on more syntactic features, like the examples we have gone through. And yes, we are using what has been already attested as a starting point. Uh, we'll conduct an initial perceptual dialect survey. We'll hear a little bit more of what that is and how it can play out in the next presentation. Um, we'll develop the Swahili dialect syntax, as Luz has mentioned, questionnaire, sorry, and collect data in the six areas. What is important is that we really want to uh, have a look at this variation, but also study it in the context of language contact, and multilingualism, and different social linguistic patterns. Uh, and as been said, the last sort of part of the project is really then looking at the social linguistics and how these varieties play out in speakers' attitudes, ident construction of identities. Uh, and maybe I'll just leave you with saying that we are really also hoping, aside from understanding, better understanding the present day variation in Swahili, also to sort of broaden or shift a little bit the understanding of like micro variation or on major languages um, because this is so far dominated by work on European languages so by drawing on Swahili as a major African language we're hoping that there will 
broaden quite a lot our understanding of all this phenomena. And hopefully I didn't go too much over time. Asante Nisana, and do please stay in touch with us if there's anything you'd like to know or share with us about varieties or dialects of Swahili, we'll be very happy to hear from you. Oh, th thank you very, very much, Teresa. Thank you, that was uh, really good. Thank you lots as well and Hannah. Um, I find this fascinating. I grew up in Morogoro, which is mainland Tanzania with a mother from Zanzibar. So I would go to school and, and say, Sisi atupendagi hivi, sisi tunaendaga shule, and come home and be told, no, tunaenda, tunapenda, you cannot say ga. So this will be fa fascinating. I'm really looking forward to your um, research and presentation. We'll move on to the um, next. Sorry, I've got um, things all over the place. I'm reading here and I'm reading elsewhere and all that. Okay. So our next presenter is... Um, is it Tom? Oh, sorry, Tom. I was looking to like to read 10 names and there you are. So it's Tom Jepke from SOAS and um, he will be talking about um, a perceptual dialect study of Shang. Karibu, Tom. Are you there, Tom? Is it better now? Okay, yes, yeah. Okay, sweet. Sorry, then headphones just play up a little bit. Um, okay, let me share my screen. Okay, can you see the presentation? We hope. Yes, um, yeah. So my, uh, I'm just presenting now on my um, MA research that I conducted while I was doing my master's in linguistics at SOAS. I'm now working on the project that was just presented about. Um, the research all took place during COVID, it was all remote. So it's maybe not too robust. So please cast a generous eye over it. Um, I don't have too much to say in the background because I want to mainly just talk about the results. Um, but perceptual dialectology, as was sort of outlined in the previous talk, investigates um, non-linguists perceptions of variation in language. Um, it can be useful as a sort of first sketch for more linguistic uh, sort of dialectological work uh, on variation. Um, and I was really interested in doing this on Sheng, particularly confined to Nairobi, because generally perceptual dialect studies look at perceived variation across a regional or national level. There's no work done on such a small geographical area as a city. Um, and in general, little work done uh, in Africa. Um, and although there is a good uh, study on Swahili, which references Sheng, um, and I think you can get that through the Swahili Forum from 2017. Um, the reference will be at the end. Um, let me just check how I'm doing. Okay. Um, so to get straight on with it, um, I spoke to some friends just to get a bit of an idea um, of what was going on and also a former colleague who was a linguist, uh, Duncan Amanga, um, on where they believed different dialects of Sheng to exist within Nairobi. When I first asked, I just said, where do people speak differently in Nairobi? And this was, of course, met with some very blank uh, expressions. Um, especially because it was all being done online. Um, so it took a little bit of refining, um, but eventually with my first pilot study response, who's just a friend, a guy in his early 20s from Nairobi, he gave me this little map. So I sent him a blank map of Nairobi and using the Instagram software, I don't know if people who are familiar with Instagram, basically you can draw over pictures um, as he has done here, you can see these blue loops are where he sort of said particular dialects of Sheng might exist within Nairobi. Um, so we had um, Eastly, uh, English, Swahili, Sheng, Arabic, because of the influx of Somalis. So these are his words, um, which he uh, sent through. Lavington site is Kiswahili, English, Sheng. Karen is English, Kiswahili, it's posh. Kiambu County is Kikuyu, the influx of Kikuyu population, Kasarani, Kikurais, 
Kikuyu Sheng Swahili. Too many Kikuyus there. Machakos is Kamba Swahili. Um, so as I was sort of anticipating initially, um, there's this consciousness of the multilingualism of Nairobi, how that impacts on Sheng, also some sort of class or socioeconomic consciousness of how that relates to language. Talk about Karen, uh, English and Swahili because it's posh. Um, and also um, this word influx that pops up. So like a real awareness of migration into the city. Um, and I didn't really get too much into that, but I definitely think that kind of side of it would be something interesting to look at more uh, in detail. Um, another pilot study, this was with um, my old colleague, Duncan Amanga. He um, sort of said that these Eastlands estates around here, Kaole, et cetera, are where the real deep Sheng is, like the birthplace of Sheng. And then he said around Kawangware, um, it will be more influenced by Luya. Around Machakos County will be Kamba. And then he also spoke a lot about Kibera and its relationship to opposition politics and how the Sheng would be um, really marked by Luo because of its association with opposition politics there. Um, so the pilot study was good. I mean, it told me at least that people were aware of variation on some level within Nairobi. Um, the Instagram idea of getting people to draw on the blank map was proving to be quite a faff. So I designed an online questionnaire in its place. Um, so the questionnaire asked where people were brought up. Um, question two was seen as a sort of necessary evil. Are there differences between the Sheng spoken in different estates of Nairobi? Um, it's obviously an incredibly leading question um, to ask. Um, but I sort of, in having uh, spoken with various people, it seemed like a necessary evil because otherwise people just had no idea what I was actually asking for. That's not to say that the study wouldn't also be good without that question because you would sort of just get a more honest uh, appraisal of what people thought variation was, at what level they believe it to exist, which is still interesting, um, but it wasn't specifically what I was looking for. Um, so then we had, where do people speak Sheng similar to yours? And by sort of mapping this to question one, I was maybe hoping to get some sort of perceptual dialect study, uh, perceptual dialect areas. Um, where do people speak Sheng different to yours? Can you mention any specific differences? Um, and then these just basic demographic uh, questions, age, gender, home, language. Um, I never really got into age or home language. I did a bit on gender, which I won't touch on too much. Um, but again, if I had more data, I think this would be really, uh, really good stuff to look at. Um, so the questionnaire got about 40 responses. Um, I sort of found that six main perceptual dialect areas were referenced the most, these being Eastlands, Westlands, Kibera. Kawangware or Kangemi, and then sort of South Nairobi. So that's the kind of wealthier estates, you know, like Karen uh, and around there. And then some sort of outlying Northern uh, estates that people referenced, but they were kind of only infrequently referenced. As you can see, Eastlands is really like the, the, the heartland, the Sheng heartlands uh, as it exists in people's minds. 90% of participants referenced Eastlands. Um, at some level. So whether that's just referencing Eastlands or specific Eastlands estates. Um, and the next highest after that was Westlands with 20%. Um, so um, yeah, Eastlands really seems to be um, the sort of key area in people's minds. Um, and using geographic information systems very uh, awkwardly, um, I was able to come up with this little map. Um, the shapes you can see are not particularly graceful. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with the software, you basically get a blank map and you can overlay shapes onto it uh, to create the areas uh, relating to however you want. So ideally there would be some pre-existing shape files that I could download from the internet relating to the various estates of Nairobi. Or if you have the technological expertise, which I did not, you can create them yourself. Um, 
I used the shapes that you can see here are um, relating to the um, like electoral wards of the city. And the uh, shading of each color. So each color reflects a different dialect area, and the shading within that color uh, within that color um, shows um, the frequency with which that particular um, estate was selected. So the only place where it's really relevant was Eastlands. And again, we have these kinds of areas around Kaole. That's where it was most frequently selected by participants, or not selected, but most frequently referred to by participants as having some sort of unique or specific shame um, or remarkable in some way. Um, so that was kind of the main part of the study was to look at perceived variation uh, in Sheng. Um, through uh, the, the open-ended questions, I got a bit of sort of qualitative data and I also followed up with three interviews um, to ask a few more questions. So the data coming on the following slides is a mixture from the questionnaires and the interviews. Um, so sort of attitudes towards Sheng, again, we've got this sort of class consciousness or socioeconomic consciousness. So we've got the lower income estates, deeper Sheng with coded lingo for the specific area, and high income estates, mostly English with a little Swahili mixed in. Then another participant said there's uptown Sheng and many downtown Shengs, and the downtown Shengs are changing every year. So again, there's this association between um, well, to me, I infer that uptown and downtown is like a westerns eastern split, so a sort of socioeconomic split. Uh, I'll be interested to hear if people would infer similarly. Um, and again, there's this perception of um, sort of less prestige or lower prestige varieties being more vulnerable to change, um, changing more frequently. Um, and we also had some very positive um, attitudes. This was one of the interviewees who was really a dream uh, interviewee in terms of speaking about Sheng. Um, we will start with having Sheng as an official language of Kenya and then an official language of the UN. And he was really, uh, really proud um, to be a Sheng speaker and to talk about Sheng. Um, so I also wanted to ask a little bit about the origins of Sheng or what people believe to be the origins of Sheng, sort of perceptual dialectology within folk linguistics is generally interested in just non-specialist beliefs about languages, be that the origins of language, attitudes, beliefs on variation. So I think the origins of a language like Sheng, you know, in a, a relatively new city like Nairobi, um, that's changed a lot in a, a relatively short space of time, uh, will be quite interesting. So we had, again, some different opinions shown here. So we've got um, the differences between Westlands and Eastlands Sheng is basically that in Eastlands, originally there are more communities that all contributed to the development of the language. But when you move to the other side of Westlands, there's less communities contributing to Sheng and hence the difference. So this idea that the, the deep Sheng, as it were, in the Eastlands is really born out of this multilingualism. Um, another participant said, people who are living in informal settlements is their normal way communication. We are all deeply rooted in our Sheng. I'll come back to that one uh, shortly. Um, so we've got this idea of the multilingual uh, influence of Sheng. Um, and then um, a, a more negative attitude that came to light, the people with the most complex Sheng, according to my experience, are criminals. And this goes back to the idea that Sheng came about as a way of not being understood by uh, you know, this idea of like an anti-language, um, whether that be, you know, kids not wanting to be understood by their parents uh, or authority figures or people not wanting to be understood by the police. Um, there's this idea that, uh, yeah, Sheng is used to avoid uh, being understood. Um, so I also wanted to know who, in their opinion, speaks Sheng. I uh, said so one participant, when you're having informal conversations with neighbours, friends, basically any time I'm not at work or at school, I will be speaking in Sheng. So 
this idea that shame is quite a common part of life, but in informal settings. Um, got this awareness of like an age split. So the younger the person is, the more the interest in shame is. And the conch part of it is adolescence because they have a lot to hide. Again, going back to this idea of not wanting to be understood. Um, and then going back to that other quote, so it's about what's common amongst us, because the Sheng I speak, I have a friend who's challenging a number of friends who are Luo, Luya, different tribes. We're all deeply rooted in our Sheng. So that, again, this idea that people speak Sheng as a way of sort of downplaying their ethnicity, um, as a marker of being Kenyan or from Nairobi, whatever it may be. Um, so there's, um, there was a lot to sort of get into, again, because of the scope of the study, I didn't really get too much into this stuff. Um, this is more just what came about through the interviews and a few of the answers in the questionnaires. Um, another idea is this, that Sheng is a variety of Kenyan Swahili. Um, this is something that has been said by um, various scholars, um, notably my former teacher, Chege. Um, and he uh, argues in his book that uh, Sheng is a variety of Kenyan Swahili, which is itself a distinct variety of Swahili. Um, this wasn't really borne out in the sort of perceptions of my participants. So uh, the first interviewee, who was a young professional in Nairobi, said that her sheng was most closely related to English. Um, interviewee two, who said interestingly that she didn't speak sheng, even though she'd uh, grown up in Nairobi, she was a young mother. She spoke more about sheng in relation to her sort of family language policy and whether her kids would be speaking sheng or Swahili or whatever. She um, said that poor literacy in standard Swahili could be a reason for the emergence of Sheng. So there is more of a re relationship between Sheng and Swahili. And interview three, who was um, the guy who said about Sheng being a UN language, he said that his Sheng came from Kikuyu. And when I sort of pressed him on that, he was quite uh, adamant that it wasn't uh, from Swahili, that the Sheng around where he was from was really Kikuyu. Um, so the last little thing I have to say is just a, one thing that comes up quite a bit in the more recent literature of the last 20 years or so is this gendered uh, difference in the use and sort of willingness to associate with Sheng. It's not only Sheng, but all sort of uh, non-standard languages. We come back to this idea of like a covert prestige that um, men are afforded cultural capital in the ways that women aren't when they use non-standard language. Um, this was present to a certain extent in my study. 65% of the respondents were men. Um, I did reach out, I, I tried to reach out to as many men as women, whether they saw that or not uh, is, um, you know, the sampling wasn't the most robust. So I won't, I'll take that with a big grain of salt. But certainly in, in terms of the more qualitative aspect of the study, the ways in which men and women seem to relate to Sheng were very different. So we had the mother from Nairobi downplaying the idea that she spoke Sheng at all. Um, and yeah, we, the sort of in the questionnaire responses, there was much more detailed information coming from the men respondents, which could suggest a sort of lack of willingness for um, women to, in, uh, to seem to be associated with, with Shen, um, even though it is really proliferating across Kenyan society. But again, I don't really have any data, uh, enough data to support that. That's just uh, one potential idea uh, that came about, which I would, uh, I hope can be investigated more deeply in future. Um, so yeah, that's all I really have to say. Thank you all for listening and to everyone for organizing. Um, and yeah, I'll go back to you, Ida. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, that was really amazing, Tom. I really enjoyed it. I'm really sort of like intrigued by the gendering of, of, of Sheng. And um, I, I wasn't aware. So you have, I mean, I'm sure people will ask you later about how Sheng is different in Karen and in Isli, for instance. I had no idea. So I'm sure we'll get some questions later during question time. And Chege is around, so he will have to defend his position about Sheng being Swahili or not. <laughs> yeah, I <wanted laughs> I'm, also, 
<laughs> I'm also hoping that people like Albert Abdallah and Ahmed Rajab would also come in and Farouk Topan and tell us if sharing is Swahili or not. So let's spice it up a bit. Um, the next uh, okay presenters, thank you very much, Tom. That was really good, brilliant. The next presenters are Makoto Furumoto, yes. Nico Nassenstein, um, and Daisuke Shinagawa. And they'll be talking on um, demonstrative systems in different Swahili varieties, investigating cross varietal developments. You're welcome. Karibuni sana. Asante. Can I share my screen? Yes, uh, please do. All right. Yes. Okay, let's get started. Okay. And so here it has diverse varieties from different backgrounds. And I'm working on some coastal varieties, uh, coastal dialects. And Nico, Nico Nassenstein is a specialist of the pigeonized varieties in the Western periphery. And Daisuke is interested in Swahili based among language registers. And uh, an important point is that each variety is apparently similar to the standard variety or standard Swahili, but it has developed a unique linguistic system. In this study, we would like to unveil such systematic uniqueness focusing on demonstratives, and we intend to provide new, pers new perspectives on variation across Swahili varieties. We will be dealing with these varieties. Oh, let me. These varieties. I'm talking about a coastal dialect called Kimakunduchi. And Nico will describe the demonstrative in Bunya Sahiri, which is a Western variety. And Daisuke will introduce his findings on the demonstrative in Shen. And before starting the discussion of demonstratives, we would like to share basic information of each variety. The first variety is Kimakunduchi. And several language varieties in the coastal areas of East Africa are assumed to be genetically closely related and are categorized as Swahili dialects. According to Nas and Hinebush, these varieties are traced back to Proto Swahili and then Proto Sabaki. And Kimakunduchi is one such dialect spoken in the southeast part of Unguja, of Zanzibar. And the Makunduchi district, where Timakunduchi is mainly spoken, is marked with a circle in this map. I call this dialect Makunduchi, but its endonym is Kikae. And in some old materials, it's called Kihadimu. Assuming a division of the coastal dialects into northern and southern dialects, Timakunduchi has been classified as one of the southern dialects. And the next variety is Bunya Swahili. Nico, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, what is Bunya Swahili or Ituri Kingwana? As the name tells already, it's spoken in, the, in and around the city of Bunya in the Ituri forest in northeastern uh, Congo. Um, I think it's the, at least, at least to our knowledge, most restructured and most deviant variety of Swahili that we have come across so far. Um, how did it reach up there in the Ituri forest? Well, there are three factors and uh, um, they can be named very shortly, actually. Stanley's, uh, Henry Martin Stanley's Manyema troops, so local recruitments and or slaves, porters and so on coming along with the Zanzibaris, settling in the Ituri. Missionary work, mostly descriptive, not prescriptive, for example, as you can see below by Stud and Grub and so on, uh, Heart of Africa mission. And then also uh, language contact with non-Bantu languages around the Kilomoto gold mines in Ituri. Next slide, please. Wait, next. Okay. Oh, yeah. it's, it's not coming. It's not coming. Try to go to click maybe uh, instead of using the arrows down somewhere, down in the left corner. Sometimes it's stuck somehow oh, 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 oh. or click back and then forth again how was that i'm seeing the next slide but 
It's we, we're not, not yet. I'm not seeing it yet. No. Wait. Uh, oh, oh, oh. Okay. We didn't want to tell the audience that we only had three slides, but now you know. Yeah, okay, perfect. Here you see it on the map, the Ituri forest. Uh, why not Kinguana or Ituri Kinguana? Simply because of the fact that uh, speakers themselves do not relate or refer to it as Kinguana. It's mostly a label used by missionaries and colonial agents who use it, uh, used it derogatorily. That's it. Then I give back to... Um, right. Thanks, Nico. So now the, uh, our third variety of our concern is Shen. And uh, Shen is actually generally or classically defined as an urban mix code emerged in post-colonial Nairobi. As described in Abzadis and Osinde, uh, Shen is based primarily on Swahili structure with a lexicon drawn from Swahili, English, and the various local languages. Shen has also been widely recognized as one of the representative uh, African urban use languages, as mentioned in Kisling and Mao's seminal paper, uh, stating that Shen started presumably around the 70s to mark youth identity. But these days, Shen seems to be acquiring the status of an urban language. In this line of observation, more recently, uh, in Chege's 2019 book, uh, Shen is identified, clearly identified as a more general urban sociolect that is placed in the continuum of varieties of Kenyan colloquial Swahili. Uh, from a formal linguistic point of view, Shen has been a subject of structural analysis for a couple of decades, and uh, several descriptions, including Bosire 2009, have pointed out its structural uniqueness, especially found in the morphology and phonology. Next, please. All right. And now we are moving on to the main discussion about structural and functional variety of the demonstratives in different Swahili varieties. Uh, we have two main points to discuss. One is about characteristics feature, characteristic features of the uh, distal forms, especially focusing on its discourse related functions. The other one is about unique development of class eight forms. Uh, let me start with the first point, which is the discourse related function of the distal form in Shen, and especially it's about the word order. Uh, at least to our traditional understanding, the canonical word order between the demonstrative and its modifying noun in Swahili, I mean, in standard Swahili, is noun followed by demonstrative, like mtu huyu, this person, uh, as stated in Ashton 1944. It should also be noted, however, that the reverse order can also be possible, especially when a noun phrase can be regarded as definite. But still, it has long been accepted that the canonical word order of the demonstrative is noun followed by demonstrative, right? However, a current study has revealed that the reversed order, which is noun preceded by demonstrative, is becoming dominant at least for locative demonstratives. Uh, Brunschirm 2015 argues that the tendency can be seen as motivated by defocusing effect, which means that now demonstrative word order has become the marked word order and uh, thus regarded as a focused expression. While demonstrative followed by noun word order has nothing to do with the focus marking and thus used as a marked frequent word order. Next, please. Having these things in mind, we will look closer at how the demonstratives are used in the text of conversation in Shen. Otherwise noted, all the data investigated here is taken from the corpus based on an interview article cited in the Contemporary Literature Journal, which is called Kwani. It is a very uh, famous uh, journal, literature journal in Nairobi, uh, published in Nairobi. Next, please. Right. Uh, according to my initial survey based on the corpus, uh, it is clearly shown that Shen uh, prefers the demonstrative noun word order, demonstrative noun word order, which is not, un, uh, not 
uh, you know, uh, canonical word, uh, and pre-verbal syntactic position. Uh, table one shows the ratio between noun demonstrative word order, which is traditionally considered to be canonical versus demonstrative noun, which is non-canonical word order. As expected, noun demonstrative word order is clearly preferred in uh, pro proximal forms and slightly outnumbers in medial forms. However, it is striking that the reversed order is dominant and noun demonstrative order is almost disallowed in distal forms. This tendency is paralleled with the Brunschrom's argument, but significant point is that it is not limited to locative classes, which means that this is a general tendency in Chum. On the other hand, table two shows the relation between the word order between the demonstrative and its modifying noun on the one hand and syntactic position in relation to the verb on the other. While there is no clear tendency of distribution in proximal forms, uh, probably public, uh, due to the scarcity of tokens, demonstrative noun order is apparently preferred in the case of medial forms relevant to the relative order with the verb. But more strikingly, uh, almost all distal forms appear in the preverbal position. This may suggest that together with the definiteness or non-focus effect induced by the demonstrative noun word order, distal forms tend to be associated with discourse topicality, which is naturally related to the preverbal or course initial position. Next, please. These features are well reflected in these examples. Uh, as for two distal forms, uh, which are in 1C and 1E, are used with the topic element, wizi, and they appear as an initial argument of a clause. Moreover, both of the noun phrases denote contrastive connotation between thefts uh, uh, who are there in those days, ule wizi likua, thefts who are there in those days, and those who are not. So the function can be termed uh, as speaker-oriented discourse anapolicity because uh, the distal forms used here serve a, serve a contrastive function that is motivated by the speaker's memory or discourse intention. Along with the syntactic feature of the form as a pseudo advisor, this discourse-related function may be regarded as a uniquely developed semantic feature of the distal demonstrative in Shen. On the other hand, typical proximal forms are used to denote discourse dioxys that pinpoints shared attention in the ongoing, uh, ongoing discourse. So he in 2D shows the discourse function to refer to the word Shen as the word that you have just mentioned, while the meaning of shall he in 3A is the very reason that we have just talked. The function of these proximal forms is clearly contrastive with the discourse related function denoted by the distal demonstrative. Next, please. Let me move on to the second topic, which is about uh, class eight form of the distal demonstrative. As is widely accepted in Shen, as well as in many varieties developed through language contact, the noun class concordance system is drastically reorganized. For example, in Shen, the agreement is basically reduced to a bi bipartite contrast between one, two, class one, two for human head nouns versus class nine, 10 for minus human head nouns. This tendency actually holds for proximal forms. However, non-proximal forms show a different agreement pattern, which is in addition to class one, two versus class nine, 10 agreement, class eight forms are also frequently attested. It is, however, not surprising in the cases of medial demonstratives because most of the class eight forms, uh, which is hevio, are part of lexical, lexical idioms like hevio. But it looks quite striking that in distal system, the class eight forms are productively used to uh, the extent that more than one third of the total occurrences are in class eight forms. So what is the reason? Next one, please. One of the clear reasons we can find out in the corpus is the fact that the class eight distal form, Bile, is frequently used as a head of a 
creative force, which expresses the manner of the action denoted by a letter verb. So as in example four and five, the vile is used as a head of pseudo letter clause, constituting a nominal clause with a meaning of manner, like how you listen to piracy, ni vile inaskianga piracy, or in a way you heard, kama vile uiskia. Right. Both of which can be all, uh, almost directly translated into standard Swahili by replacing vile with synthetic relative form like vivio skia, right? However, the following example seems to show an ongoing development of grammatical functions of the form. For example, vile ilivio in example, in example six clearly seems to correspond to the standard expression jeans ilivio suggesting that part of the idiomatic expression jinsi has been replaced with grammatically more productive vile. The example seven illustrates the natural cause headed by vile behaves as at least functionally an adverbial subordinate clause rather than a nominal clause with a meaning of manner as in, class, as in examples four and five. Finally, in the example eight, which is not a straight example of vile, but is an equivalent in that uh, the venia is also a typical relativizer in Shen. The class eight relativizer venia actually modifies the adverbial word bigumu, which may not be directly expressed through relative formation strategy in standard Swahili. In that sense, this may be seen as a grammatical development through expansion of the function of this demonstrative, which may be quite characteristic uh, in Shan or Kenyan colloquial Swahili. That is for my part. So Nico is going on. Thank you, Daisuke. Let's take a, a brief look at formation patterns in Bunya Swahili. There is a reduction simplification. There's only one single demonstrative form, le, kitule, mutule, and so on. So the distal it has been retained. The others are no longer there. Uh, the e is often dropped, omitted, so ile becomes le, um, which also happens in Central Sudanic languages, for example. When elicited specifications occur, so you can say very often kitule apa ili tokanguka, kitule pale, kitule, kitule kule, and so on. So that thing that I saw yesterday, this thing over there, and so on, especially with elicitations in free speech, not so often, at least not in this position. Uh, next slide, please. So here we see the, um, the formation uh, um, patterns. So generally um, you see it's always the same form, but uh, uh, with the first class and the second class as pronominal forms, you have lele, yele and pale and so on. Otherwise it's always le. So um, whenever um, these, uh, in, 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 in these cases, for example, or in other cases, um, the, these specifications occur very often syntactically. Next slide, please. Yeah, when not elicited, uh, um, they remain often in their original syntactic position, meaning that hapa or pale or kule remain in the sentence and not necessarily in the noun phrase where they are. So, for example, example 12, maneno ya eleksion hapa kubunya le kukongo le. Electoral problems here in this bunya in this Congo and so on. So they do not have to be shifted to become part of the real demonstrative somehow. That's interesting because hypothetically we could assume that maybe these local adverbial demonstratives, the bus here, the child there and so on, replace in the end uh, the real demonstratives in uh, bunya Swahili because we have examples 14, 15, 16, for example, where we only have adverbials that express the diaxis but no real demonstratives anymore. I mean, they are demonstratives, but they are used, of course, very often lexicalized or as adverbials. Next slide, please. So we also uh, are modeling this on the suggestions by, that Daisuke brought up for Sheng. Uh, the word order is also interesting here because um, generally Bunya Swahili displays more head of the noun phrase followed by the demonstrative than demonstrative preceding the noun phrase. In preverbal position, uh, the demonstrative often more often precedes the head of the noun phrase actually, and in post-verbal position, the opposite is the case. We find a relation between word order and anaphoricity or, well, a higher degree of anaphoricity. Ashton observes something, something like that also for ECS. In Bunya Swahili, anaphoric reference to antecedents seems stronger with the word order found also in ECS. So the demonstrative following the head noun actually, uh, reducing ambiguity. 
I will just read this example here. Uh, when I batoto kwenda ona ba film le, yabama pendo le, ile batu kwa pendana. So those people, they laugh each other. Bikwa fanya tendo yandoa. No, they do marriages and so on. So if you said batu le here, it would be ambiguous, according to speakers. Uh, it also is also triggered or triggers topicality or non-canonical word order here trigger is triggered by discourse topicality and also contrastivity very often. So sasa ule vieux in example 18, palele, so that guy, that old man in his place and so referring to what has been said before uh, also has to do, um, um, triggers this non-canonical word order for demonstratives. Next slide, please. We also find these examples or these, these forms of hivi of class eight, even though the, the proximal uh, demonstrative is otherwise not used in Bunya Swahili, meaning something like, uh, like this of this kind. We find vile, uh, meaning to or also, maybe from Swahili, standard Swahili, vile, vile. And as a modifier in the noun phrase, moja ivi, moja hivi, certain such some. Um, so uh, is this a reintroduced feature is our question? Is it retained? Is it a, a, an acrolectal reference maybe to the standard? All this is possible. Next slide. What are the possible factors for variation here? External factors, language contact with Central Sudanic. Some Central Sudanic languages um, have of course demonstrative forms, but have also a determinative. So having only one demonstrative form, form actually, and no other distinctions looks like a de determinative, like Ashton says, the in English, the apple fell or something like that. Um, this at least could, explain, could be explained with replication from Central Sudanic. Internal factors, of course, le has shows a, a tendency as also shown, for example, in clitization, otherwise in Bunya Swahili, when it's added behind, for example, and almost clitized to the head of the noun phrase. And then social factors, lectal variation. Some speakers, ethnic Hema and Landu, are said to speak like this. Others turn it around and Babira speak differently and so on. And I give back to Makut. Thank you. And my part is very short, so no worries. So I'm talking about Kimakunduji and Kimakunduji is very similar to uh, Sandra Sohiri in that it makes three, four distinction. However, uh, the forms differ uh, between the two varieties. And furthermore, uh, Kimakunduchi differs from standard Swahili in that it has reduplicated and contracted forms. Oh, so like for example, so this table, uh, the, their forms is summarized in this table. And uh, for example, you know, uh, the proximal you know is uh, corresponding to Huyu in standard Swahili and the Uyo and the Yuria uh, correspond to Huyo and the Yure respectively. And additionally, Kimakunduchi has compound forms. The compound forms can be deco decomposed into two parts. The first part is uh, the proximal or medial, medial demonstratives from class one to 11. And the second part is likely to be derived from the protism around the medial forms of the locative classes uh, that is class 16 and class 17. And if the first part is a protismal form, the second part is also a protismal. And if the second uh, first part is medial, and the second part is also a medial. And the uh, important point is that the the additional forms such as contracted and reduplicated and compounded forms are restricted to the proximal and the medial demonstratives. So the distal demonstrative differs from the proximal and, and the medial forms in that it lacks the additional forms. Furthermore, the distal demonstrative differs from the proximal and the medial demonstrative in that it cannot function to identify the referent in space. When pointing to a distant object, the compound form, not the distal form, is used. This is shown in uh, 26. Uh, and uh, 27 is an example in which the distal demonstrative can be used. Uh, 
So this example uh, is not LCAT from a natural speech, but the distal demonstrative is very frequently in natural speech. Okay, let me give you a brief summary of the whole four talk. And uh, through the description of the demonstrative in the uh, three varieties, we have realized that further investigation is necessary for two points. The first point is related to the distal forms. As exp I explained in Kimakunduchi, the distal ria is deviant in the demonstrative system formally as well as functionally. And for Bunyasahiri, it only retains lay forms. Ashton, uh, she associates the media O with anaphoristy rather than proximity, proximity and differentiate it from the proximity around the distal. In contrast, Kimakunduchi and Bunyasohiri suggest that the distal, but not the medial, can potentially be differentiated from the proximal and medial demonstratives. And considering that the distal can have an important role in discourse, as Shen suggests, it's likely that the distal can be reanalyzed as a discourse marker, which causes the change and the deviancy. But this is my position. But Nico suggests it is also necessary to uh, consider that possibility that distal can be differentiated because of its formal feature. And the second point is uh, related to the class eight forms. In Shen, non class distinction of the demonstrative is reorganized. However, the class eight distal and medial forms are actively used. The class eight distal VLA seems to be developing into an adverbial relativizer. In Bunya Sahiri, the class eight demonstrative, uh, which is exceptional, retain original forms and distinction, have acquired new adverbial functions. The class eight demonstrative can be referred to mana in addition to the concrete object, since class eight is associated with the concept of mana. So we are thinking that this feature is related to the unique development and the categorization of the class eight demonstrative in Shen and Bunyasuhiri. That's it. So they are references and they are our acknowledgement. Asante sana. Asante sana, sana, sana. This was fascinating. I'm sure during question time, we'll all ask a lot of questions, especially about Bunya <laughs> Swahili. Bunya Swahili really fascinated me. Uh, with all the French, I could see Fidel and all that. And also the Kimakunduchi. I know there's a lady called Rukia Ramadhani. Yeah, hey, Namjua. Yeah, Namjua. Basi ndiyo. Yeah. Ame andika kuhusu. Alikuja hapa sos kuchutembelea. Aka zuhusu hey, kuhusu kitabu chake. Aka hukumu na mfahamu. Uh, so let me just invite our last speaker before we have a, a, a video presentation. This is uh, Nasra Habibu Ali. Kwa hivyo Nasr Habibu Ali atazungumza kuhusu nadharia ya umbo upeo katika uswahilishaji wa maneno ya Kiingereza. Na dakika shini kwa hiyo sasa hivi basi karibu sana bi Nasr. Asante sana Ida. Uh, asante sana uh, wandaji wote wa baraza conference. Asante kwa nafasi hii ya kuwasilisha. Uh, naweza kushare? Ninafikiri can 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 she anaweza kushare? Can she share? Yeah. Okay, I think it's ready now. Una, unaweza ah tayari. Ndiyo, uh, nadharia ya umbo upeo katika uswahilishaji wa maneno ya Kiingereza. Uh, okay, makala hii na husu nadharia ya umbo upeo inavyoweza kubainisha uswahilishaji wa maneno ya Kiingereza. 
na uh, uswahilishaji huo uh, ni dhana inayotumika kueleza mchakato wa kuingiza maneno ya mkopo ya Kiingereza katika sarufi ya lugha ya Kiswahili, kimuundo, kimaana, kimofolojia na kifonolojia. Kwa hiyo ni dhana ambayo inatumika kueleza namna ile maneno ya Kiingereza yanavyoweza kuingizwa katika lugha ya Kiswahili na kuweza kukubalika katika sarufi ya Kiswahili. Uh, uswahilishaji umetokana na mwingiliano na uh, inafahamika kwamba lugha ya Kiswahili na lugha ya Kiingereza zimekuwa na mwingiliano wa muda mrefu kwa hivyo Kiswahili kimepata nafasi ya kukopa maneno mengi kutoka katika lugha ya Kiingereza na uh, mwingiliano wa lugha na ukopaji ukopaji wa maneno unaweza ukatokana na uh, uhamishaji wa maarifa yani kama kuna maarifa mapya anahitajika kwenye lugha basi lugha hiyo inaweza kukopa maneno ya kitaalamu kutoka kwenye lugha nyingine kama ilivyo kwa Kiswahili lakini pia zinapoingizwa bidhaa mpya katika uh, lugha ambayo hizo bidhaa hazitokani na lugha hiyo basi lugha inao nafasi ya kukopa maneno kwa ukopaji wa maneno si jambo geni kila lugha inafanya hivyo na sio kwa Kiingereza uh, sio kwa Kiswahili peke yake kukopa maneno kutoka katika lugha ya Kiingereza na maneno hayo <coughs> yanabadilishwa ili yaweze kuendana na sarufi ya lugha inayohusika na katika ubadilishaji huo maneno hayo yanayokopwa yanapata mabadiliko mbalimbali kwa hiyo uh, makala hii inahusu hayo mabadiliko yanayotokea katika maneno yaliyokopwa ambayo yanaswahilishwa katika lugha ya Kiswahili mabadiliko hayo yanaelezwaje kwa kutumia nadharia ya umbo upeo Nadharia ya umbo upeo ni nadharia iliyoibuliwa miaka ya hivi karibuni na iliasisiwa na mwanaisimu eh, na wanaisimu Prince and Paul uh, mwaka 1993 lakini eh, kiunzi hiki pia cha nadharia baadaye kikatiwa mwega kikaendelezwa na uh, mwanaisimu John McCarthy na Alan Prince eh, nadharia hii Uh, iliibuka kutokana na matatizo yaliyojibainisha katika kiunzi rasmi cha fonolojia za lishi kuhusu udhania wa uwakilishaji e, wa vipengele vya kifonolojia kama ambavyo wanaeleza Alan na Smoleski e, kwamba wao walijaribu kuachana na sheria za ukokotozi wa umbo la ndani hadi kulifikisha katika umbo la nje na kupunguza ule udhania ambao ulionekana katika SPE au Sound Patterns of English ya Chomsky na Hale. Kwa hivyo madhumuni ya mwanzo ya kuanzishwa kwa nadharia hii yalikuwa kushughulikia masuala ya kifonolojia. Uh, hata hivyo baadaye kiuziki kimetiwa uh, kimetumiwa pia kushughulikia masuala ya kimofolojia pamoja na kisintaksia. Uh, madai ya msingi ya nadharia hii ni kwamba miundo mbalimbali ya lugha hujengwa kwa kuzingatia mikenzo na masharti zuizi au kwa kifupi tunaita mashazu yaliyopo katika lugha inayohusika. Na masharti haya yamo katika sarufi majumui na katika sarufi majumui hujumuisha mashazu yanaweka vigezo vya ukubalifu wa maumbo ya lugha zote duniani ambao ndio hutumika kuundia sarufi ya lugha moja moja kwa maana hiyo kwamba e, mash, namna lugha moja na lugha nyingine zinatofautiana katika upangiliaji na uthamini wa masharti zuizi kwamba ni lipi linakuwa lina nguvu lipi halina nguvu kwa hiyo ndio namna lugha zinaweza kutofautiana lakini masharti hayo ni ya kimajumui na kila lugha inachukua hayo masharti zuizi na kuweza kuyatumia katika sarufi yake. Ah misingi ya umbo upeo uh, nadharia hiyo umbo upeo ina misingi mikumi tatu ambao ni masharti zuizi e, zalishi 
pamoja na tathmini masharti zuizi kulingana na nadharia hii yamegawanyika katika makundi mawili ambayo ni masharti ya uadilifu na uh, masharti zuizi ya uziada masharti zuizi ya uadilifu hujumuisha familia, familia ya masharti zuizi ya utangamano ambayo haya yanahitaji kwamba kuwe na uh, utangamano au kuwe na mshabaha au mfanano baina ya umbo ghafi na umbo tokeo na katika masharti zuizi haya ya uh, utangamano kuna masharti zuizi yanayozuia udondoshaji wa vitamkwa yaliyomo katika umbo ghafi ambayo yanaitwa uh, fiki uko lakini kuna masharti zuizi e, yanayozuia uchopekaji wa viambajengo au vitamkwa vyovyote katika umbo ghafi ili kuwe na mfanano baina ya umbo ghafi na umbo tokeo hapa umbo ghafi ni lile umbo ambalo linafanya kuzalishwa maumbo mbalimbali na yale maumbo yanayozalishwa yanatathminiwa ili yaweze e, kukubalika katika sarufi ya lugha inayohusika kulingana na hayo masharti zuizi namna yalivyopangiliwa kwa mujibu wa sarufi ya lugha hiyo kwa hiyo kuna sharti zuizi lingine linaitwa uh, shabi yani kushabihiana yani inahitaji kwamba vitamkwa eh, sifa za vitamkwa baina ya eh, umbo ghafi na umbo tokeo basi ziwe zinafanana na ndio maana inaitwa masharti zuizi ya uadilifu lakini yapo pia masharti zuizi ya uziada ambayo haya masharti zuizi ya uziada eh, yanaruhusu mabadiliko katika umbo ghafi ili kufanya maumbo tokeo yakubaliki katika sarufi ya lugha inayohusika kwa hiyo masharti zuizi haya hulifanyia tathmini umbo kwa kuyapa kipaumbele mabadiliko ya umbo tokeo likilinganishwa na umbo ghafi yanaoleta ukubalifu katika sarufi ya lugha inayohusika. E, swali linalojibiwa katika uh, makala hii ni kwamba je nadharia umbo upeo inaelezaje mabadiliko ya maneno uh, data iliyotumika katika makala hii ni data e, ambayo imepatikana katika makala ya kishe inayohusu uhalishaji wa maneno ya Kiingereza e, ambapo pia uh, ameweza kubainisha e, namna maneno yanavyoingizwa katika lugha ya Kiswahili maneno ya Kiingereza yanavyoingizwa katika lugha ya Kiswahili kwa maana kwamba kuna mabadiliko mbalimbali yanayotokea ikiwemo kuingiza kwa kuingizwa kwa sauti, kudondoshwa kwa sauti, e, kudondoshwa kwa kuingizwa kuongezwa kwa irabu katika maneno mbalimbali ya, ya, ya Kiswahili. Kwa hivyo makala hii inaangalia hayo mabadiliko sasa yanayotokea kwenye hayo maneno yanaelezwaje kwa kutumia hii nadharia ya mbupeo. Masharti zuizi katika uswahilishaji wa maneno ya Kiingereza. Hapa nadharia imetumika uh, nadharia ya mbupeo pia imetumika katika uchambuzi na uchunguzi wa maneno ya mkopo katika tafiti mbalimbali za, za, za zinazohusu uh, uingizaji wa maneno ya kigeni katika uh, lugha nyingine kama ambavyo uh, katika utafiti wa mutua ambaye amehusisha kikamba E, anyona pamoja na moze ambao wamehusisha lugha ya eke gusi. E, kuna masharti zuizi pia katika katika uswahilishaji wa maneno ya Kiingereza yapo masharti zuizi ya uadilifu pamoja na masharti zuizi ya uziada na masharti zuizi ya uadilifu ni fiki huko yani fiki huko kama ukubalifu ambao linazuia e, uh, udondoshaji wa kitamkwa chochote katika umbo ghafi ili kuwe na kushabihiana baina ya umbo ghafi na umbo tokeo na tege ambayo inazuia uchopekaji 
wakiambajengo chochote e, katika umbo ghafi ili kuleta mshabaha baina ya umbo, umbo ghafi na umbo tokeo na shabi ambayo inahitaji kuwe na sifa uh, za vitamu kwa ziwe zinafanana baina ya umbo tokeo na umbo ghafi uh, kwa hiyo hayo ndio masharti zuizi ya uadilifu e, masharti zuizi ya uziada ni haya yafuatayo kuna sharti zuizi ambalo linahitajia maneno ya Kiingereza yanaposwahilishwa yaandikwe kama yanavyotamkwa. E, na sharti zuizi kwa mujibu wa makala hili imeandikwa kama hivyo. Lakini kuna sharti zuizi lingine ambalo inaeleza kwamba neno la Kiingereza linaloishia na wai au kieyusho wai linaposwahilishwa ile wai badilike na kuwa i a vile vile kuna sharti zuizi e, ambalo linahitaji kwamba neno la Kiingereza linaloishia na konsonanti linaposwahilishwa inachopekwa irabu vile vile e, kuna sharti zuizi ambalo linahitajia neno la Kiingereza lenye silabi yenye irabu mbili linaposwahilishwa basi irabu moja idondoshwe vile vile kuna sharti zuizi linalohitajia neno la Kiingereza lenye consonant zaidi ya moja zinazofuatana linaposwe e, na uchanganuzi unabainishwa kwa kutumia sasa hayo masharti zuizi e, namna sasa maneno hayo ya Kiingereza pamoja na mifano yake yanaelezwa ambapo uh, kuna alama mbalimbali kwa mujibu wa nadharia hii kuna alama mbalimbali na bidi ziwe zinatumika kuna alama inaonesha kwamba hili sharti zuizi lina nguvu zaidi kuna alama inaonesha hiyo alama yenye nyota mbili au zaidi inaonesha sharti zuizi lina nguvu kiasi kuna alama ya nyota moja inaonyesha sharti zuizi hafifu na hilo sharti zuizi hafifu maana ni sharti zuizi ambayo linaweza likavunjwa na hilo neno bado likaendelea kukubalika katika lugha inayohusika. E, kuna alama pia ya mkono ina, inaonesha namna e, kwamba hili neno ndio ambalo limefikia upeo ukubalifu na linakubaliwa katika sarufi ya lugha ya Kiswahili. Na uchanganuzi huo umehusisha pia majedwali ili kuweza kuonesha mpangilio wa masharti zuizi. Usawishaji wa maneno ya Kiingereza anaishia na kieyusho kuna maneno eh, ya Kiingereza kama diplomacy ambayo kwa Kiswahili ni diplomasia, technology kwa Kiswahili teknolojia, uh, lexicography na kadhalika haya yanaonesha kwamba eh, masharti zuizi yanaweza kutumiwa ili kueleza sasa mabadiliko yanayotokea katika maneno hayo ni haya hapa kwamba mpangilio wake ndo huu linaanza sharti zuizi linahitaji kwamba neno uh, liandikwe kama linavyotamkwa lina hilo hilo sharti zuizi hilo linakuwa ndio sharti zuizi lenye nguvu kabisa kwamba hilo likivunjwa maana neno hilo linakuwa halijakubalika kwenye sarufi ya lugha ya Kiswahili lakini pia linafuata sharti zuizi linalohitajia kwamba e, neno la Kiingereza linaloishia na wai basi ile e, kile kiisho kibadilike na kuwepo kwa irabu mbili ia kama ilivyo kwenye diplomasia lakini kuna sharti nyingine linalofuata fikia ukoma ukubalifu kwamba kusiwe na kitamkwa ki, ki chochote ambacho kimedondoshwa lakini kwenye tege ndo linalofuata kusiwe na kitamkwa kita chochote ambacho kimechopekwa katika lile umbo ghafi e, katika umbo tokeo ili kuwe na e, mshabaha au kufanana baina ya umbo ghafi na umbo tokeo e, na sharti zuizi hafifu la mwisho ni shabi kuwe na vitamkwa viwe na sifa zinazofanana sasa masharti zuizi haya kama nilivyoeleza kwamba yanaonyesha kwa majedwali na hapo tunaona tuna umbo ghafi teknolojia ehe kwenye umbo hili basi kuna maumbo haya maumbo tokeo yanayoshindanishwa kwa zuizi kwa kuminiwa kama yamefikia vigezo vya haya masharti zuizi 
ili aweze kukubalika kwa hiyo kuna uh, neno la kwanza teknolojia samahani kidogo nina shida kidogo ya screen naona imepotea lakini naweza kuendelea so okay ni kama dakika mbili ibaki haya haya nashukuru kamili asante yeah. kwa hiyo uh, kwenye hayo maneno eh, yanaweza kuzalishwa maneno kadhaa yakaweza kupimwa au kutathminiwa na yale masharti zuizi na neno linalokubalika katika lugha ya Kiswahili linaweza kuelezwa. Kwa hivyo hivyo ndio namna ambavyo e, nadharia ambayo upeo inafanya kwa kuyapangilia masharti zuizi na masharti zuizi e, maana yake ni yale ambayo yanatokana yana, yana na namna maneno ya Kiswahili yanavyoundwa. Neno la Kiswahili linaundwa liweje na hivyo hilo neno la Kiingereza ling hizo likidhi vigezo gani au vya, vya masharti zuizi yaliyopangwa katika Kiswahili ili liweze kukubalika. Uh, naweza kuhitimisha uh, kwa kusema kwamba uh, uchambuzi huu umejikita katika mkabala wa kinadharia e, tofauti na uchambuzi wa awali hata ambao umefanywa na kishe wa namna ya uswahilishaji wa maneno ya Kiswahili haukuwa umejikita katika mkabala wa kinadharia kwa hiyo E, uchambuzi huu umeweza kubainisha ni masharti zuizi gani ya lugha katika sarufi ya lugha ya Kiswahili yanaweza kutumiwa kuingiza maneno ya mkopo lakini pia e, hii inaweza ikatupa pia uh, na, na chachu ya kuangalia katika lugha nyingine kama Kiarabu Mash, yale maneno yanayoingizwa katika Kiswahili kutoka katika lugha ya Kiarabu je yanafuata masharti zuizi yapi asante ni sana kwa kunisikiliza Asante sana sana tunashukuru umetufunza mengi leo na biashaka baadaye tutapata muda wa kuzungumza zaidi I'm sure kuna, kuna wanaisimu wengi watakusubiria baada ya wakati wa maswali na majibu Sasa hivi tunamkaribisha tuna um, uh, Hel Goldman Hele Goldman uh, na yeye atazungumza kuhusu video ambayo alitengeneza Kwa hivyo Hel Goldman will be talking about a video uh, on a group of youth who are hunting civets. Is, is it called civets in Pemba? That's and, right. Uh, is it civet? Yeah, okay. Yes. Okay, so please, you're, you're welcome. Karibu sana. Okay, thanks very much. Can everybody see my title slide there? Yes. Okay, great. The technology is always a challenge. <laughs> I think we've handled it pretty well. <laughs> um, oh, there's one thing that I wanted to do. I'm just going to turn up my volume a little bit. Hold on. Let's see. One second. Okay. Here I am again. All right. Um, I am going to present a, um, a very short video that I took. Uh, it emerged really out of a, a chance encounter while I was doing a very short stint of field work in Pemba in 2019, which is the last time that I was there. Um, this is not about really about wildlife. I am well aware that the um, subject, the main subject of this conference is not wildlife or uh, Zanzibar or Swahili ideas about animals or practices related to animals, although I please suggest that might be a really neat subject for a future Baraza. Um, but anyway, I'm just going to give a few minutes of uh, introduction to my video, and I hope that it will be uh, of interest, especially to the language specialists among you. I am not one of them, so I would be really glad to hear from anybody either in the Q&A section afterward, or uh, if you want to email me, it'd be really great to know more about what I have recorded here. Okay, briefly, uh, I think everybody knows where Pemba and Uguja are. Um, in 2019, as I just mentioned, I returned to Pemba um, to do a very short field work in the same area in which I had done my doctoral research in 1992 and 1993. Um, it's a village called Mzambarauni and the surrounding hamlets. It's deep in the traditional clove country. There is a picture of bustling, booming downtown of Zambarani. Um, and then the blue circle, which I hope that you can see the blue ring, that shows where I went uh, a couple of days with some people that I knew from the village to help them 
pick rice. So this was the kind of terrain that we walked through. It's a mix of uh, trees like clove trees and coconut palms and fruit trees and lumber trees, as well as wild trees. And then interspersed were the rice, uh, the rice fields and the valleys, the bondani as they're known, and also other cultivated fields uh, or mashamba. So there we were uh, picking, harvesting rice. And this was July and I um, was doing the, the best that I could to, to help the ladies. When I heard uh, getting closer and closer, a lot of loud shouts and whooping and dogs yapping and sort of the breaking of branches got closer and closer. It was coming through a patch of uh, mixed trees to the side of the, um, the field. And so I asked my, uh, my friends there, what's that sound? What's going on? And uh, Maua, she's the woman on the upper, upper right. I've known her for, I guess, almost 30 years. <laughs> Um, oh, she said, oh, it's just a bunch of, uh, of young guys uh, out hunting wadudu. So I said, oh, really? What, what wadudu are they after? And she said, ngawa. Ngawa is, uh, in Pemba, it's the word for small Indian civet. This is an introduced small carnivore introduced from Asia at some uh, unspecified, unknown time in the past. Um, on the island of Nguja, Ngawa refers to a different species of civet, the uh, African civet native species. But anyway, in, on Pemba, it refers to the small Indian civet. And I have been doing research on wildlife and also on ideas and practices related to wildlife on Nguja for, I don't know, 20, 25 years now, 20 years. But I had never done it in Pemba. And I really was not that familiar with the practices and ideas related to uh, small carnivores in Pemba. So when she said that they were out hunting, these guys are out hunting in Gawa, I became very interested. And I, I dropped my, uh, my handful of rice heads and I grabbed my camera and my notebook and I ran off into the, uh, the forest to meet them. See if I could find these guys. So I rather soon encountered the guys. Here are three of them, I guess all together, there might've been more like eight, 10, something like that, but their, their hunting had finished. They had indeed just caught and killed a small Indian civet, um, which you see here. And um, they were all quickly sort of peeling off to go back home because they'd been up since very early and they needed to go home and, and sleep and eat. I detained uh, these fellows for a little while. I asked them a little bit about what they did um, when they were hunting. Um, and they promised to get in touch with me so that I could actually join them on a hunt uh, another day. So weeks passed and I, I didn't hear from them. I forgot all about it. And then one night, um, just as uh, I was getting ready to go to bed, my hostess in Zambarani got a telephone call from um, this guy that you see in the front. His name is Ahmed, uh, also known as uh, Hosama. That's his nickname. A lot of these guys have funny nicknames like, um, mm, uh, techno and uh, Maasai, they have these sort of cool nicknames. They were about to go out the next day, early the next day to go hunting and they wanted to know if I would like to join them. So of course I said yes. Uh, and uh, in the pre-dawn darkness, I set out the next morning um, and I found them, uh, met up with them in uh, Tandavili. This is uh, sort of a cluster of, of, of hamlets in a village uh, south of Zambarani. So I had with me my camera and, um, and not much else. And I just tried to keep up with these guys as we basically ran for an hour and a half uh, through rice valleys and then up onto the ridges, uh, through dense patches of undergrowth, um, across lumpy fields. And um, everything was still kind of wet from, from the morning dew. And it was a lot of sort of slipping and sliding. Um, and they moved very quickly and almost nonstop. And it was basically all I could do to keep up with them. I am, they are there, as you can see, in, in the, the peak of, of fitness. <laughs> and I am a middle-aged woman with two artificial hips. <laughs> um, so it was all I could do to keep up with them. Um, 
And I filmed with a rather shaky way uh, parts of the hunt when I could kind of catch my breath a little bit and we were crossing kind of level terrain um, and not moving quite as fast. So uh, I will present to you in a moment, a very short, it's like a two minute video of, of, of what I did film. The, the visuals are, are terrible. Uh, so just know that in advance, but I would like to draw your attention to the audio part of it and the way that they are calling and shouting, especially to keep in touch with each other probably, and also to excite the hunting dogs that they had with them. Um, and I think that I even hear some kind of uh, an alveolar click. I might be getting the word for that wrong, but there's an interesting popping sound that they're making as well. I didn't get a chance to ask them much about that aspect of it when we met we, afterward and I talked to them a little bit. I was mostly asking about their hunting practices, but I would like to go back uh, another time and ask more. So um, here's the video, and then I have a couple more brief slides after that just to sort of summarize. So here we go. Uh, okay, so th that was it. Um, I think you can hear also a little bit, you can hear me kind of huffing, <laughs> puffing in the background. Um, I hope that you could hear the audio okay. Um, I think that um, I will try, I will certainly try to get more information and try to participate in more of these hunts next time that, that I go. Um, they did not catch a, a civet or anything during that, uh, that morning. They did discover a, uh, a bush baby uh, sort of midway through that video, but they don't take bush babies because they don't consider them to be a pest. Uh, or as the civets, um, they attack chickens and the vervet monkeys um, take the crops and snakes is another thing that they kill. Snakes are of course um, considered a, a big danger to, to people. Um, I then just by, by chance, um, oh, there's a couple of the dogs there. <laughs> That's another kind of interesting thing, I think, linguistically is the funny names that the dogs have, names like uh, Fanta and uh, uh, Reddy and, and names like that, but that's another, another subject. Um, I found out uh, later on that, um, that British fox hunting calls are kind of similar in that they have a, a vocabulary of exciting the dogs and also being very specific about like if a fox has been seen and things like that. 
you can listen to um, many different kinds of calls and their explanations on this website that I, you see here called the Hunting Act. And I have recorded um, a very small sampler. It's a very brief sampler, which I'll play right now, just for comparative purposes. I could, my arrow is, oh, here we go. Okay, here we go. Uh, I think this is interesting because I had always imagined hunting as a very quiet activity. Uh, you know, your hunters are sneaking up on, on uh, their quarry, but there are obviously different kinds of hunting and both in that case of Pemba and, and fox hunting, hunting with dogs. Um, it, it's a very different thing. It seems to be a very loud activity and there's a lot of communication between uh, among the people, among the hunters and also from the hunters to the dogs. And I think that's kind of interesting. Oops, sorry, trying to get to the next slide. Okay, so I'm going to wrap that up. I'd be, like I said, very glad to have any feedback. If anybody can shed light on this, um, either in the question and answers or you contact me by email afterwards. And um, I thank you very much for your attention. Hi, thank you very much, Hel. I think some people couldn't hear the, um, the sounds very well, but I could hear sort of like, there was a bit of whistling, I think, sort of like, um, and uh, it, like, I don't know, like this kind of sound from, 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 from the mouth. I don't, maybe somebody will know um, what the sounds were, um, but I'm not sure if everybody was able to hear. Oh, I'm sorry. I did a, I did a test uh, with a friend of mine yesterday and he could hear it. So, but I can, I'll gladly send uh, the video or a link to the okay, video yes. who yeah. wants to hear it. I'm sorry about that. I thought oh, that- no, Don't worry. Oh, okay. we can, yeah, we can then share with the, with the group and uh, sort of like, um, yeah. But thank you very much. That was very, very good. So everybody, if you have a question, um, please put it in the Q&A. So the first thing is to you, Hel. Rita wants to know, what do they do with a civet cat they caught? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, they were going, they told me that they were going to sort of uh, put it over an open fire and kind of burn off its hairs and then they were going to feed it to the dogs. They do not, they do, you know, they're, they do not eat animals with claws um, um, as, as most Muslims do not, but they did consider it, you know, appropriate dog food. And certainly uh, quite a few of those dogs looked like they could have used um, a meal. Okay, okay. I thought they were going to sell them like, as, as pets or something to, I don't know, whoever likes pets. Okay. Oh, no, they, they are killed on the spot immediately, and the, the dogs will later get them as a meal. And I asked uh, whether there are any kind of medicinal parts that could be used from these, any of the animals that they kill. Do they collect any parts for any kind of, you know, okay. you know any kind of medicine of any kind? And they said, no, absolutely not. Uh, okay. We also have a question from Rachel. I think this is to Lutz. Um, I'm not sure. Are the Tanzanian GA, I'm not sure what that is, and the Kenyan NGA variants? Um, I think this, I, said, I think, oh, Samani, I think I saw that in the, in the chat. Is that right? Yes. Uh, it's the Ag and the Ang. Mm. That, yeah, that's a really interesting question. So it's, well, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure that's my race. Yes, sorry, it's Hakunaga, Hakunanga, if you like. Okay, so um, I thought it was like, okay, yeah, go on. Um, and there is, you know, I mean, both, both these forms are, are old and reconstructable. So across Bantu languages in general, both Ark and Ang forms occur. And then we don't really know what, what, the, what the historical development and relationship is. And I'm sure there's, there's variation in, in, in Swahili varieties. I, 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 I'm, we, we don't know. The, the answer is we don't know. That's precisely what we want, want to find out. I, I would imagine it's less likely to be on Kenyan Tanzanian grounds because, because one of the influences will be um, contact with other, with other Bantu languages. And I think, I think the variation is more fine grained than, than on, on, two, on, on a northern southern split. Uh, but in a sense, that's precisely what the project is asking. Uh, 
um, I was just asking my dad, okay, do you know any variant apart from Kuaga, Kulaga? And he said that he knows there's Zanga, Kulanga, but he doesn't know any other. So, <laughs> sorry. Chege has a hand. Yes, Chege, please. So if, if you could, um, Aki, if you could uh, yes. allow Chege. Can you hear me now? Yeah, dear. Can you see me? I, I should have liked to see you. That's I can see you. I'm not sure so. why. Um, Aki, um, I, I, is there anything that can be done? Like, can we press <laughs> I've got my camera on anyway, but um, yeah, join us panelists. You have, so. Um, what can be done, Aki? Oh, okay, I got it, I got it. Oh, All right, go. here I am. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, hi. Hello, everybody, yeah. Good, Makoto, where are you? I can't hear you. <laughs> I'm here. How are you doing, Baba? Now, now, we go Mahali Pazuri. Eh, eh, eh. You go Makunduj. Okay, good. Yes, uh, it's really great to see you all and uh, get in touch with you. Um, we are very well here. At, here I'm at home. This is my my little library at home. And uh, yeah, this is it has been great, you know, all of it. And uh, really, really pleased that um, Ida and uh, Angelica and everybody else, uh, uh, you know, have maintained Baraza and we shall continue and remain strong. Um, I mean, there's so much to talk about. We, we can't, you know, I, I, I wouldn't want to take all the time about um, uh, on this topic. Fascinating work, uh, Daisuke, Lutz and everybody, um, I think, it's long overdue this study on micro variation in, in, in Swahili, that's for sure. Um, we, we all understand that Swahili is probably, you know, I mean, all languages have great variations, uh, but Swahili seems to be a particular, uh, well, probably English might become close, um, but um, it is really important to have a look at all of this. Um, Tom, I think uh, your work is also really, really um, interesting. And I mean, I'm familiar with it, of course, because uh, when you were writing your MA thesis, we, we had many discussions. Um, and um, one little thing about the, fit, the, um, the, the, the comments about, and you said it yourself, the word influx, I think is, uh, is, is, is probably not the right one because uh, Kikuyu's into Kiambu. Actually, I'm sitting in Kiambu right now. <laughs> so, and so it's 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 the actually the the the, the homeland, if you want, the traditional very very uh, Kikuyu area. Nairobi is right next to it. So actually, it's, it's the other way around. There is an influx of non-Kikuyu speakers into the area rather than the other way around. Uh, that's not just um, an indication of what you said earlier. Uh, non-linguist perceptions about language, right? Um, there are all kinds of interesting things. And, and the one that strikes Shang changes every year, for example, you know, that Shang changes. I think I made a comment somewhere in the book that um, the evidence of rapid and constant change is not that really evident, right? I mean, there's a lot of um, a lot of structures, if you look at them very carefully, whether it's the lexicon or whether it's some of the grammar, well, the grammar is different because it doesn't really that change that much. But um, the, the, I don't see much evidence of that rapid change. There is a recycling of, 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 of things. And they, of course, there are new influences coming in. So there's new vocabulary, but it's not that, um, I mean, I don't think any language changes uh, yearly. I still retain my position that uh, uh, Sheng is really remains on the continuum of Kenyanese, which I called Kenyanese, you know, ways of speaking, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, Swahili and English and so forth. Often, now that I'm here and I'm paying more attention after, you know, many, you know, uh, uh, many years of looking at this and being away, sometimes I'm tempted to think of Sheng as a, some kind of fossilized interlanguage, uh, which uh, because it's, 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 it's it, to an extent, it's actually even idiolectal at some level, right? Um, um, there is, and, and this is where the perception about rapidity of change comes in, because individuals make up their own shame on the hoof, right? And so there is, uh, I think that we still have a long way to go before we actually conclude exactly what shame is all about. Um, 
And that point about poor literacy in standard Swahili is what drives me you know, to, this, to this idea. Because really there is very poor literacy in, in standard Swahili, so-called standard Swahili uh, across the board, outside of the academia, outside of the scholars, outside of the you know, maybe in lecturers and university students. Generally, um, the, 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 the knowledge of uh, 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 book Swahili is, is very, very limited. And so people compensate for that, you know, by bringing in, by translanguaging, as we're calling it these days. Um, and and it, it actually makes it a lot more uh, complicated. The element of anti-language still remains, you know, because as the, especially with the politi you know, political situation here, <laughs> that idea of not saying exactly what you mean still is very, very present. So that dimension, should not be lost as well. It, it still, I think, remains very, very, very strong. Now, my real little, uh, my, my concern sometimes, not necessarily with your project, with your work, but including my own, is the point of departure in comparing or looking at the variation in Swahili. Um, we tend to uh, uh, base or use a starting point uh, Ashford, for example, you know, the, the traditional classic, you know, formal grammars. And, um, well, we all know the, the, the trouble with, uh, you know, uh, standardized varieties of the language, the formal standard. So when Ashton is writing in 1944, this is shortly after the East African Territorial Language Committee. And, and so clearly there would have been very clear attempts to, you know, to, you know, remove the messy parts of the language, you know, and keep the clean part of it, which is now where we are starting from. I wonder sometimes, uh, you know, uh, whether we can go be further than that, beyond that, and actually still consider Kiunguja as the starting point, but not the Kiunguja of Ashton, okay? Um, and I'm thinking here of uh, Tipu Tip's autobiography, which was originally published in 1902, and here Nico will do very well because it was, you know, there was a German version first and the Swahili version. And when I read the English, well, the one that was published much later on, I think in 1954 as a sort of a supplement to the Interterritorial Language Committee work, I find it's quite, you know, it, it does fit a lot of what we call standard Swahili today, but there are many other elements which will not be found in the standard book grammar. Is it possible that we can even go beyond that and maybe start looking at what has changed in Kiswahili, not from that you know, standard grammar, but from actual original data? There might be recordings somewhere. There might be songs. There might be things that have been recorded and so on. But I'm thinking Tipu Tips might be, <laughs> might be a good starting point because he was, he's, a, he's, a, you know, he's a Zanzibar. He's, a, he's, a, he's speaking in Kiunguja in 1902. Would that be possible? You know, as a starting point, and therefore, when we are looking at uh, what has happened with the demonstrations, for example, and so forth, it might be useful to consider that. But it's another tall order, and uh, but it's just uh, a little uh, thought that comes to my mind. Um, yeah, um, I, I won't say much more because I'm, you know, we're still, you know, I know it's a work in progress, and I'm very happy to continue, you know, uh, you know, uh, participating in this. Um, yeah, so let me stop there because I'm sure others want to say something and um, just throw that off uh, out to you if you would like to go back to Tipu Tip as your main informant in looking at uh, <laughs> the grammars. Thank you. Yes, definitely. I mean, Lutz and Nico and um, Hannah, do you, is it like what? what's your response then? And, and for Rumoto and everybody else. <laughs> um. Yeah, yeah, very nice, and and thank you for your comments. It's it's great to see you. Um, I mean, I think you, you, I mean you answered your own question by also saying that um, you know, uh, Sheng is an idiolect. So if we take it to Swahili, actually, we don't even want to just focus on Tipu Tips Swahili, right? I mean, we want communities of of speech, and um, I think we are certainly not aiming to take like Ashton nineteen forty seven and compare it to six varieties. Um, I think one of the motivations behind this project was those of us, you know, here uh, and in this space who work on Swahili, a bit of a frustration that there isn't a reference grammar and reference grammars themselves are problematic and incomplete and have all sorts of challenges, but it would be nice to be able to cite a reference grammar, uh, which wasn't from 1947. Um, 
you know, regardless. Um, and so moving this sort of discussion about, well, what is Swahili? And of course, your work very much contributes and is, is sort of central to that discussion. What What is Swahili and what would a grammar of Swahili even look like if we were able to, to write one? So, um, yeah, certainly, I think great, great suggestions. And if anyone knows of recordings and original data, um, then please, please send it our way, because that would be fantastic. It'd be wonderful to be able to compare. I mean, we've got almost more than 100 years now right to, to that time so yeah thank you very much maybe talk to a few missionaries yeah well, maybe start with the british tanzania society you know bts i think they have uh, sort of like uh, quite a number of people who used to be in colonial east africa still members there so that might be a good point a good place to start can i just invite donald maingi to ask uh, a question I think are you are allowed to talk here. Anybody else, just please raise your hand and you will get the permission to, to speak. Um, so, Donald Maingi. Okay. Hello. Um, I'm really, really grateful to, to, you know, to participate and to hear from Chege, you know, um, Githura, you know, and I was really, really fascinated by uh, the, the word uh, fossilized interlanguage, um, you know, rethinking about Shen, um, and also uh, the presentation from Tom and uh, uh, Furumoto about Shen. Um, and, you know, just, just the sense that uh, uh, having, having been a Kenyan uh, who was born, uh, you know, and and bred, uh, you know, with Sheng as my first language, as I can say, you know, uh, you know, just the complexity of Sheng is amazing. You know, basically, when if I remember in the 1990s when it was kind of the golden age of Sheng, and you know, uh, then the 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 DAOs that you know. Uh, that traversed uh, the, the, the Nairobi, uh, uh, the, the Nairobi Ocean, you know, uh, as we, we used to call them, were the Matatus, you know, these these artifacts, this, um, you know, this, uh, and 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 the topographies of the different regions uh, within Nairobi were clearly demarcated by. The, the 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 type of shen uh, that you know was constantly growing, interlayering uh, itself. And I remember one time, you know, in, I, I used to call a house hao or joint or genya, only to find you, you know a friend of mine calling it dungaro, dangoro, you know, keja, ngwaro, you know, yeah, that sense of getting lost was really apparent you know and, and and such that you know even right now I, I would be a foreigner if I went to the same joint you know um, in terms of language and to me you know just just what uh, echoing what uh, uh, the professor Gipiora has said um, just just the sense that um, the evolving sense of uh, Nairobi Swahili, and also even if you go to Western Kenya, the the the, the Swahili, which is actually also uh, a branch of Sheng, or, or uh, when you go to uh, Central Kenya, uh, is is different. And also, uh, one one of the things that I was wanted to really uh, posit, which I I found was the great kind of the facilitator of, uh, of the growth of Sheng was the political environment. Um, and I remember, uh, you know, in the Kanu days, you know, you could not, you could not talk in a particular way uh, quite often because, you know, in particular, you know, the, the, the ears were, you know, you know, uh, you know, you could be re get yourself into trouble, and so you know, 
I'm not a linguist, but that, that's what I, I can say, you know, uh, rethinking about how the reimagination of informal Nairobi, how the topographies have been redefined by the way in which uh, language materializes, dematerializes, and, you know, transforms. It's, it's like, you know, transforms itself into objects and objects that surround that 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 uh, you know take specific discourses in specific regions and respond to um, the political environment in in uh, in a very situated manner so that's my comment yeah yeah okay thank you very very much so maybe we can just connect that and ask tom he he had um uh, as in like one presenter had said the most complex Sheng is spoken by criminals. Um, <laughs> and so then there's some attitude there in terms of, of Sheng. So thinking of what Donald said and what your informant sort of like told you, do you have any, any thoughts that you want, you want to share with us? Sorry for putting you on the spot. No, it's cool. Yeah, I, I completely agree that one of the good things about these kinds of studies is they tell us a lot about the sort of human geography of a place as well as the linguistic situation. Um, so that's definitely really interesting and all the attitudes that come to light. Back to Chege's point, um, whether it's not, whether it is or not a variety of Kenyan Swahili, um, I would agree with Chege from a sort of linguistic point of view. But I think where there is tension between what everyday people think and what academics think, it's just good motivation to try and have a sort of as nuanced a view as possible of the variation, not just in terms of Swahili or Sheng, or, but any language. And so then if you talk about it at like an idiolectal level or as a fossilized interlanguage, I think those are the sorts of concepts that will be really helpful moving forwards to actually understand what it is and how it's changing. Yeah, thank you very much. So um, does anybody want to ask maybe interpanel any question to each other? Because um, I'm... I'm there's probably a, a full, is there like a, a, a comment? Um, so Rachel is just saying that Danga, uh, which I find used in Kenya, and I am Kenyan, if I remember right, Irerimbabu Kiswahili Luga ya Taifa has something on it. I'm yet to hear Ga in Kenya. It is usually Nga. I look, I look forward to the results of your study. Yeah. Okay. Sawa. So, I mean, if we don't have any more questions, or is there, uh, there are two hands on the panels? Hold on, I'm still learning. So Nico, please, and then Daisuke. Only if there's time, huh? And hell. So, there's time, uh, yes, yes, go just, on. Just a, just a curious uh, a curious question uh, to, to, um, to Lutz and Hannah and, and the whole team um, uh, concerning the, um, well, the, the location of the, and also the languages and, and areas where you are going to work in the frame of this very uh, interesting and very important uh, project. How did you choose them? Uh, I was wondering, um, I mean, I may have already an answer or, or an idea about some of the field sites knowing what you have worked on before, but still um, maybe I could also ask, why did you not, for example, include Burundi or the Congo um, out of pragmatic reasons? So, shall I answer that very, very briefly? Yeah, pragmatic logistical funding. I mean, yeah, it would be fantastic. And I think the longer term project would be to do everywhere where Swahili is spoken. Um, but we we have yeah partner based in Tanzania and one based in Kenya, and we wanted to, to focus on that. So that's why we chose those two countries um, and why the different places. I think that was, was it Lutz was talking about? So in each place we have uh, we have two coastal areas, um, two kind of Barra mainland areas, and then two areas which we expect to have contact between Swahili and other Bantu languages and Bantu and non-Bantu. So um, we got to six, but we could have, you know, 20 or 100, um, but yeah, kind of logistics. But that's the that's why those six places to start with. For well, the next funding period, then maybe to... <laughs> Ongoing collaborations with Unico, we will expand out and, and yeah, DRC would be great. So Looking yeah. forward to it, thanks. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay, okay maybe uh, I'm second one. Yeah. Yes, please. Thank you very much, and I'm very happy. First of all, I'd like to say I'm very happy to be here, and you know, so in the very wonderful session. And uh, so I have lots of things that I want to ask, but the first one is about uh, the local. Uh, dialectal variety of Shen, which uh, you know Tom is talking about. So I'm very curious about that. What kind of difference are there? I mean, what kind of dialectal difference are found in Shen? Is it? I can, I can you know easily uh, you know imagine that there must be a kind of lexical difference or lexical yeah difference between them. But also there may be a kind of phonological difference or maybe more like morphosyntactic kind of uh, difference. So I would like to know more know more, more about that. Is that to Tom and Lutz? Uh, to, to, to Tom, I think, yeah. Oh, Tom, okay. Um, I think, uh, Chege, if you're still here, will certainly be better placed to answer that question. Mm. Um, the purpose of my study kind of bypassed the actual linguistic variation. Um, so I only sort of referred to it where, you know, a participant might ask. Um, mm. It was more really just to see what people, you know, if people perceived variation, and if they did, you know, how did they? Um, so it was interesting. I don't think I got a single, um, I got a few lexical examples in the interviews, but in the questionnaires, all the ways in which people spoke about variation in Cheng was like sociological factors, like socioeconomic status, or, you know, so mm. I think on a, on a micro level, like one city, because it's like not as spaced out, it's harder for people to actually identify like discrete varieties. So they start reaching for other factors like sociological factors. Um, but there is variation now, I'm sure I'll, I'll pass over to Chege. Uh, yes. I've lost. Yeah. Oh, Chege, there you are, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah very quickly. And I, I think that question from Daisuke and um, I think there lies the value of Tom's work, because I think it's a lot more to do with perceptions and attitudes. Now, th there is a reality that there are um, concentrations of uh, different speakers of different ethnic, you know, Kenyan languages in certain parts of the city. So clearly, uh, Kibra, you know, which is the probably the most famous um, uh, locality, you know, uh, informal settlement, so-called in, in, in Nairobi, there's no question that um, the predominant second language is a Nilotic language, Dolvo. When you go north of the city, Gidurai, which uh, Tom mentioned, there's no question that the dominant language there is Kikuyu. Now, the reason why Karen and Westlands come in, I don't think it's because of the Sheng, because <laughs> from my uh, linguistic study, look, you know, analysis of the, what they speak, it is more of a perception or an idea that they're speaking Shang, what the Islanders would not consider Shang, right? So it is a matter of the same translanguaging we are talking about, depending on the audience design. So the Westland person who is more, probably more proficient in English, Kenyan English, uh, will move down the Kenyanese uh, uh, continuum and act or talk Shang. But yeah, there is an idea that there is an element of truth in, in that division. Now, whether, as you say, it, it bears any linguistic truth, that remains to be seen. Thank you very much. Yeah, I now understand that there, may, there is also at least a difference of perception, right? So it's not like, you know, structural aspects, but it's also related to the, the, the perception of people. What is Shen, you know, what, what the Shen is about, right? Thank you very much. And, if I can and, add one more thing, right. Mm -hmm. I was just, and also there's an element of um, um, competition, yeah? Because remember, Sheng is also a product now, okay? It is, it is sellable. And so you want to make sure that your Sheng is the one that sticks out, is the one that sells, is the one that is contracted by the companies who are advertising in Sheng. And so it is very easy to, uh, for speakers or, or groups of speakers to, uh, to belittle, or rather to, to have, you know, uh, a lower understanding or perceptions, uh, sorry, less positive 
uh, attitudes towards the particular particular brand of shank. So yeah, there are many issues involved here, and it all boils down to um, sociological factors. Wow. So Tom, this, this, I mean, we're waiting for your study now. This is fantastic. Can we have Hel and then uh, Lutz? Hi. Um, I, I ask for your indulgence because I think I may be able to play the video another way. It's really only a couple of minutes. And since you couldn't hear it, I thought I could just try to play it again and just see if this works. All right. I'll just go for it. Thanks for your uh, indulgence on this. Let me see if I can find it here. Wait, I've got it. Wait, hold on a second. Sorry, I lost it. Sorry. Okay, hold on. Sorry about that. Um, too many buttons open. Oh, shoot. Edie, you're muted, sorry, whatever you were saying. I was saying, so maybe while that's coming on, Lutz could, uh, thank you, Tom, Lutz could talk, because I think the, 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 the sort of like the panel cuts off at a certain time. It's like automatically done by source. Like everything is. <gasps> Please, Lutz, Karibu. Uh, thank you. I mean, just briefly, I mean, it's it, it just to, to agree upon I me, mean, it's the discussion with the uh, Chega and, and Hannah had earlier about Ashton, and I. I, I'm, I so sympathize. It's dis distinctly odd to work with the 1944, you know, learner's manual. In fact, I mean, it's a very good work, and we all like it. But it's it's completely inappropriate, really, for the kind of work we want to do. It's just we don't really have anything modern. It's it's, it's odd that you know we have very good descriptions and and state of knowledge for big world language, of which Swahili is one really, but say northern one. So you know, English, of course, French, German, Japanese. And also increasing little languages that because of this, the, the work on endangered languages over the last 20 years, we have in, 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 in for African languages, there's quite a bit of substantive grammatical descriptions for, for languages with, with much smaller speaker groups. But some of the, the intermediate one languages sort of uh, have been overlooked almost. I, I think it's similar maybe for Indonesian, for Hindi, certainly for Swahili. I think people are a bit, little bit scared because we don't quite know what it means to be a standard to start with. So we don't want to add a standard grammar. Um, so we have to tackle the variation element. I think, I think probably we need much more corpora. So check what you were saying about, about Tiputip and then this, we have diachronic corpora, but also, also modern day corpora. So there, you know, there's the Swahili corpus, which people use. Um, I, I think, you know, in a sense, I mean, our project is small, but, but I think as a future aim, I think it would be extremely helpful to have a much more comprehensive description of, of present day Swahili, you know, I mean, not quite standard maybe, but drawing on, on, on a little bit on variation, but also on, on things which, you know, most speakers would sort of agree as being, yes, I can, I can, I can say that, I can hear people, people saying it. And, and I think to get there really, it would, it would need consultancy work, and it would need, you know, negotiation like in these sort of four actually, um, but then also the corpus work and looking at, at a much bigger text selections. Um, and then and see what happens. But I think it's a wonderful aim to have. I think it would be really, really nice. Thank you. Thank you. And I think this idea of of uh, of the standard Swahili, like the standardized versions, has has somehow run through the whole of today. We started off with with Jalal, sort of like talking about standardization, with um, um, I mean, sort of like his work. And I think it's gone through. So it's very. I think it'll be important to definitely relook at. I agree. We have one question. Um, Hiroko, Hiroko Maezawa. So. Um, Please, uh, uh, yes. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, thank you for your interesting talk. Uh, I'm uh, in particular interested in third talk um, by Fumoto Nasinshita and Shinagawa. And uh, I'm not a specialist of Bantu, so uh, my question uh, might be a trifling, but uh, I'm just wondering um, uh, specifically what position uh, you are assuming is associated with, uh, with focus or um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, topicalization or defocus, defocalization. 
Uh, I'm, an, uh, I'm a syntactician, so I'm curious about the uh, structural position, but uh, now, for now, um, I would be happy uh, if uh, you could just um, define, it, de define them uh, in terms of a word order. Maybe I should answer to this question. Thank you very much for the you know, uh, interesting question. And I think, so what I was talking about is actually, is, you know, uh, I was basing on the uh, discussion uh, by uh, Eva Marie Blumstrom in uh, 2015. And what she said, what, what she discussed is about the uh, relative word order between demonstrative and uh, head now. And uh, in standards for Hili, I think, uh, you know, the word order uh, noun followed by uh, no. Yeah, yeah, that's one. So head now followed by demonstrative is a kind of uh, canonical word order, right? Mm -hmm. And this is, I mean, uh, uh, but that word order is now associated with, uh, I think so, yeah, that word order is now associated with the a kind of focus uh, function. So uh, the, let's say the non-canonical word order, demonstrative, Normative is now becoming a kind of, uh, you know, uh, unmarked word order, which is, uh, you know, uh, which does not have to do with the the, the focus or something. So, the uh, demonstrative okay. noun word order is a kind of unmarked word order, uh, mm -hmm. according to uh, her discussion. And uh, so uh, noun were... demonstrative. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Uh, so you are assuming that uh, um, uh, non uh, uh, focus is uh, not associated with um, associated with a specific position, but uh, uh, related to uh, unmarked or marked position, right? I mean, uh, I'm as I was assuming that, uh, uh, for example, to uh, focus uh, to topic is associated with pre-nominal position, uh, but. Uh, uh, you, uh, your assumption is uh, not uh, of that kind, right? Yeah, I, I, I think so. So um, uh, uh, what we can say is that uh, the noun demonstrative, noun demonstrative word order is now associated with the focus marking. Uh, yeah, uh, so mm -hmm. uh, you are assuming the uh, pre-nominal uh, position is associated with uh, for uh, with topic, right? Mm, no, <laughs> not necessarily. I think. Mm. Okay, uh, mm -hmm. probably this is a kind of um, idea, uh, uh, way of thinking of uh, syntax chance. So, uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much uh, for thank your you answer. Thank you very much. But maybe, maybe you can you can take this from here and uh, and discuss some more. So we have our last panel coming up in five minutes, and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can have your comfort break now and you as in like you need to c come out of this and then join again but asanteni sana this was fascinating and i'm so pleased that um this that, 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 thank you very much asanteni sana asanteni. see you soon all right go ahead <laughs>